Hello everyone and, thank, and welcome to this webinar on the benefits of selecting Australia as a medical device clinical trials destination. My name is Duncan McInnes and I'm Director of Stakeholder Engagement at MTP Connect. Our session today is presented by Austrade, the Australian Trade and Investment Commission, MTP Connect, Australia's Industry Growth Centre for MedTech, Pharma, Biotech and Digital Health and the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance. We'll be talking about how running clinical trials in Australia can help you maintain momentum in your clinical development program. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I stand, the Camaragal people of Eora Nation, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Now a little housekeeping, uh, there will be time for questions at the end of the presentation, and we ask that you submit any questions using the Q&A box, not the, chat not the chat function. All attendees will be able to see your question, and you're welcome to submit anonymously if you, if you wish. If you have the same question as someone else, you can upvote that question using the thumbs up icon. We'll collect all of the questions that don't get addressed during the session and follow up to provide answers by email where possible. The session is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast and an on-demand webinar. If you'd like to learn more about the Australian medtech and pharma sector, you can subscribe to our podcast via Spotify, Apple Podcasts or most of the usual places. Now, I would like to introduce the Honourable Peter McGoran, Australia's Consul General and Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner, Austrade Houston, to welcome you on behalf of Austrade. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Duncan. Um, it's a great delight. To, sorry, it's a great delight to be with everybody. Uh, it's, it's a stellar panel ahead of, uh, to speak ahead of us, and there's a, a great group of participants registered. I know, and I want to give you some idea briefly at the outset. Uh, what Austrade does. It has two major strengths when it comes to uh, medical uh, device clinical trials as a destination. The first is our extensive network throughout North America. We have experienced investment directors located in Vancouver, Toronto, uh, Boston, New York, Washington, Houston, uh, San Francisco and Chicago, all available to provide information and to support inquiries. The second thing that we do, uh, which brings um, a unique benefit to those considering clinical trials, is that we partner with organisations with the full support and, and authority of the Federal Government of Australia. Uh, we can work with like-minded bodies to ease the, the way forward and to uh, comply with whatever's necessary to make the task even easier for you. So NTP Connect and state and territory governments are essential partners for us. We know them, we work with them and have for a very long time. And that's brought results because over, over the last uh, 15 years, the number of clinical trials in Australia has uh, grown by some 21%. And, uh, and uh, in the last couple of years, it's grown by even a greater amount. And companies look to Australia for clinical trials for a number of reasons. The top reasons we keep hearing, uh, not surprisingly, is firstly, Australia's diverse population and locality in the Asia Pacific. The second is a streamlined regulatory system. And the third is strong IP protection. And I think you can add all, uh, to all of that, um, strong and vigorous, industry and government support. But our, our, speak, our speakers and presenters will touch on these topics a bit later on. Um, for companies interested in the Australian clinical trials environment, Austrade can provide a lot of support. I'll just briefly outline a few so, so you can keep them in mind as the presenters are speaking. Um, we, we shared information at the start of this, so there's contact details for some of our uh, investment directors, particularly Michelle in Toronto. So what does Austrade bring to the table? Uh, we reduce the time, cost and risk for companies. We do that because we have access to market intelligence and investment opportunities, as well as information about the business environment and regulatory environment to guide companies step by step through the process, which can um, obviously be appear daunting within any jurisdiction. We offer guidance on Australian uh, support programs, such as our generous, if not world's best, research and development, tax incentive and approval process. We can open doors for you. We excel at facilitating introductions to Australian service providers, government officials, and anybody else that you need to make commercial 
and sensible decisions. In fact, our team spans the whole world. There are some 93 Austrade posts around the globe, and we can draw on them for any, for any information or support as you require. And we would welcome the opportunity to speak to companies about the opportunity to understand your business goals and how to further them working as a team. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, the Managing Director and CEO of MTP Connect, uh, Dr. Dan Grant, uh, an expert in this field and is far better qualified than I to speak on the attractions of Australia as, as a clinical trial destination. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'd like to also begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I reside at the moment, pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to thank Duncan um, and the MTP Connect team for putting together this webinar and of course thank Austrade for, for their support in, in putting this together. I'm really here today to um, talk to you a little bit about Australia as a medical device clinical trial destination, give you a little bit more information on the reasons why we believe Australia is an ideal location for you to come and conduct your clinical trials, um, and hopefully by the end of the hour convince you that, that that's the case. Now, Libby, uh, there we go, my slides are now working, so, so we'll just get sorted. Really, um, Australia is ideally set or suited as a destination for clinical trials. When people select a location to do their clinical trials, they often think about the conditional factors that are important in running a trial, regulatory requirements for certain markets and the market size, ultimately, that your product will be, be sold into. But there are a whole host of competitive factors that also need to be considered, and it's those competitive factors that Australia ranks very high. Those factors, as um, um, Peter indicated, really focus on quality, speed, and cost, and I know um, the other presenters today will talk to you a little bit about each of those in their presentations as well. But I do want to point out that, that Australia has a very sophisticated medical research environment. Right? We have one of the world's best healthcare systems. It's supported by a network of universities, medical research institutes, public and private clinical research sites. We have five of the top universities in the world um, in Australia. Five of, the top, five of our universities are in the top 50 of the QS rankings. We have outstanding um, clinical and research infrastructure in Australia. We also have, as Peter said, rapid um, approvals and a robust regulatory framework. And I'll talk a little bit more about the regulatory framework and, and the advantages that Australia's framework has for getting you into the clinic rapidly. Importantly, the data that you collect in your clinical trials in Australia is transferable and recognized by other regulatory bodies, including the FDA and EMA. Cost always is a consideration. I'll talk a bit about cost uh, and the cost effectiveness of doing your trials in Australia. And of course, as Peter said, we've got an ethic, ethnically diverse patient population. But perhaps more important than that, we have a patient population that is used to being involved in clinical trials. And in fact, over the last 10 years, um, more than 5 million patients um, or participants have, or people have participated in clinical trials across Australia, that's about 500,000 per year, which is really um, a recognition of our community's acceptance of the importance of clinical trials. Um, now, Libby, I've lost control of the slides, but I've got it back now. I mentioned that we have a sophisticated medical research environment. Our med tech, biotech and pharmaceutical sector is strong and growing. We have about 1,300 med tech and pharma companies in Australia. About 135 of those are listed on the ASX stock exchange with a market capitalization of upwards of $200 million. We have 50 medical, independent medical research institutes and more than 40 universities all focused on delivering clinical trials. <clears throat> Pardon me. We have strong clinical trial networks across Australia. We have biobanks and other facilities that enable clinical trials. And importantly, we have a strong workforce that can deliver your trials. There are about 68,000 people employed in the medtech, biotech, and pharma sector, including 7,000 plus individuals focused purely on delivering clinical trials in Australia. Now, Peter mentioned that we have a streamlined clinical trials notification scheme in Australia, and I know that, that um, Falco may talk about this later in his presentation. 
But in Australia, we're not required to go through an IND process like you are in, in the FDA. Rather, we have a CTN, a clinical trial notification scheme for the vast majority of clinical trials. And this, in essence, requires that the sponsors submit uh, for ethical review, study documents, including protocols, investigator brochures, and informed consent documents for review by the Human Ethics Committee. At the same time, uh, this sponsor would submit the government's documents, the legal documents needed to conduct the clinical trial. The Human Ethics Committee would approve those applications. And then there's a simple notification process to the TGA. And in fact, that notif notification process can actually occur at the same time as you submit your human ethics um, application. As a result, um, from the time you submit your ethics application until the time the trial begins, um, you can see timelines of approximately four to six weeks in, in many cases. Now, obviously, sometimes that, that stretches out for very complicated clinical trials. But in average, about four to six weeks from application for your ethics review through to being able to initiate your trial. <clears throat> so we have a sophisticated medical environment. We have a robust, rapid regulatory time frame. The CTN process allows for you to very rapidly get into the clinic. We also have significant um, cost savings or cost advantages for doing your trials in Australia. Several years ago, Frost and Sullivan did a study and demonstrated that Australia is on average about 28% cheaper to do your, your clinical trials than it is in the US. And that's before the generous tax incentives that exist in Australia. And in fact, if you include the tax incentives, Australia can be upwards of 60% cheaper to do your early phase clinical trials. And central to those tax incentives is our R&D tax incentive. I really don't want to spend too much time on this, and I would recommend every company consider taking their own independent tax advice. But in essence, Australia has what is called the R&D tax incentive. And for companies, Australian entities, so companies that have an Australian um, um, entity, with an annual aggregated turnover of less than $20 million, you can receive 43.5% as a refundable tax credit on the R&D you do in Australia. And what this means is if you're eligible and your expenses, expenditures are eligible, for every million dollars of research that you conduct in Australia, you will get $435,000 cash back into the entity to be able to support other research activities. For companies with an annual aggregated turnover of more than $20 million, they're also eligible, but they're eligible for a non-refundable tax credit used to offset uh, against other taxes that, that they have to pay. So for small companies that have less than $20 million um, turnover, this, this benefit of 43.5% refundable tax credit can make a huge difference to you being able to get your clinical trials um, completed um, in a cost-effective manner. Um, just go up one slide. Okay. Um, the, the other thing, of course, is that, that Australia is a unique environment at the moment. Uh, all of the world has been hit by COVID-19, um, but Australia has had a particularly strong response to COVID-19. We've had only um, just under 30,000 confirmed cases. And in fact, if you look in the middle column or, or, or um, list of new cases in this slide, you'll see that in many of our states and territories, we have very few, if any, active cases or new cases happening. And what this really means is that our clinical trial sites are now open for business again. Um, in a recent study that was published by um, one of our CRO, CROs, Novatech, they looked at the top 10 sites um, across Australia, which represents about 33% of the biotech activity in terms of clinical trials. And you can see in this table, the vast amount of green means that these sites are now open. Um, the ethics and governance process is available and open. Site initiation is happening either in person or by video, with the exception of one hospital. Recruitment is ongoing. Participant visits are allowed or there are remote visits being conducted. Monitoring is happening either on site or remotely. And of course, there's an, an expedited um, effort when, when it comes to conducting COVID-19 trials. So all in all, we have this sophisticated medical research environment, robust, rapid regulatory time um, framework, 
quality transferable data. We've got cost efficient environment to conduct your trials and we're open for business where other, other sites um, currently are closed because of COVID-19. And then of course, there are a host of other reasons and Peter touched on some of these as to why Australia is an ideal location. We are close to Asian markets um, and, and these markets are backed by free trade agreements. We have an eth ethnically diverse population. Globally recognized key opinion leaders, I know Gemma and Jason will talk about this in a minute. We have a multilingual population, a Western disease pattern, and of course we have seasonal differences. So for, for um, companies who are conducting trials for respiratory conditions, flu and whatnot, um, it makes a lot of sense to come to Australia to conduct those trials in our, in our flu seasons. So I, I want to stop there and, and really just leave you with the message that indeed we do have the infrastructure and capabilities of conducting clinical trials. Our, T, our CTN scheme allows you to get into the clinic very rapidly and painlessly. Quality data, quality key opinion leaders and investigators, cost efficiency driven by our R&D tax incentive, particularly for small, smaller companies who are are going to find a huge advantage of getting that 43.5% back in cash. And of course, we are open for business, um, particularly given our response to COVID. And I'll pass back to you now, Duncan, thank you. Thanks so much for that, Dan. A really great overview, really appreciate it. Um, I now ask uh, Professor Gemma Figtree, President of the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance and Professor of Medicine at the University of Sydney to introduce the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance and how they can assist you in running your cardiovascular device trials in Australia. Over to you, Gemma. Thank you so much, Duncan. And it was great to have that introduction from Peter and Dan. Um, today, you've actually uh, got two interventional cardiologists, but we're both a bit uh, unique in terms of our passion for whole of pipeline research, right from basic innovation through to clinical trial and implementation. So my name is Gemma. I'm, I'm an interventionalist here at Royal North Shore Hospital, but I'm also the president of the Australian Cardiovascular Alliance, which has only been in existence for about three or four years, but has actually made profound progress in bringing together many of the fantastic skills that we've got in Australia. So we're a not-for-profit, not but we have a belief that the time is right for a new vision, new thinking, and completely new strategies to make a vibrant, sustainable, world-class cardiovascular research and industry ecosystem. And we're believers that embedding research in health, which is a fantastic opportunity here in Australia at the moment, it puts us in a very strong position, but also strong partnerships with our industry uh, members. And we hope to continue to expand that. We have, we, are, we have our fantastic research institutes right around the country, some of those in basic science and some of them in clinical trials and beyond. We also have uh, a huge number of industry members from device companies through to pharma uh, and increasingly in imaging and data management. And what we would love to share with you today is our experience at bringing all of this together. The context of our work is that cardiovascular disease is not all solved despite the perception in the community. And there are a number of hurdles that we believe we're in a strong position to try to solve here in Australia. One of them is at the implementation end where we have strong evidence and of both value and efficacy for treatments, but we're just not getting it to all Australians in the best possible way. There's obviously a coordinated strategy required to translate innovation and discovery when we know it could benefit patients, but it's not got there. And then there's the missing biology in cardiovascular disease, which I think in the next 10 years is going to actually make a big difference to the way we actually see patients rather than bucketing them all together necessarily as one condition. Um, we will begin to understand that there's many different uh, individual phenotypes. I think I might have just lost control there, Libby, of the um, the screen. No problem. I'll just give that back to you. Thank you. Hopefully that'll work. No, maybe if you can just flick it on, that'd be perfect. Oh, there we go. 
So what we've done is actually set up these six flagships right across the, uh, the whole pipeline of research and crossing many of the silos that broke down different disease entities to really try to make sure that we can accelerate discovery and innovation. This is implementation and policy, clinical trials, big data, precision medicine, bioengineering, drug discovery. And we've underpinned these with capacity building initiatives. Um, you might just move that on for me, Libby. Sorry, it's not working. Great. What we've recognised is that it's not just about money, but it's about alignment. And when we bring together our army of researchers with our industry members and our health partners, we can actually make a big difference. So we're engaging over a thousand researchers and this continues to expand, but under a really uh, very strong governance model. And MTP Connect are now very much engaged with our researchers across this. Um, we have our inaugural executive director, Kerry Doyle, who's had huge experience in science technology and also cardiovascular. And we've, we've got strong engagement of the emerging leaders as well as our industry and commercialization committee, which has two goals. One is to really try to attract um, global and local industry to work with us uh, in a much more sustainable fashion and make Australia the place to be for all levels of uh, research in the cardiovascular space. And secondly, to try to accelerate um, evidence to, to be best benefit patient care when we have that. And so that involves think working with government on regulatory issues, et cetera. Importantly, this structure actually allows us to really engage with government, with industry, with patients, and obviously with our clinicians who often have strong research track records, but are very busy and are not able to drive these things themselves. Again, recognising that these things are, are, are need to cross the whole pipeline, we have, have worked hard with the various different funding bodies from the local um, community, but also beyond money, recognising that our collaborative platforms are what matters. We've successfully advocated for a massive investment from the federal government in terms of the mission for cardiovascular health, which makes research even more attractive in Australia. Um, and the goal here is to really accelerate Australian-led research to advance cardiovascular health through creation of a world-class sustainable ecosystem. And we want this to be attractive for global industry to come and be working with our world-class researchers and clinicians. This has actually given us a much needed injection for national collaborative efforts for prioritised problems. But in addition to this, what we've been doing is setting up really strong clinical trials platforms, big data platforms, health economic platforms, um, as well as an industry interface that makes it a very attractive place to be. We believe that Australia has got what it takes and we're trying to build this up as a, as a, a, a position to, um, to really have a buzzing, vibrant environment for researchers to be working strongly with industry. MTP Connect play an absolutely key role in this, and it was really nice to hear Peter's discussion about the way that um, research is, is now being seen, not just as a, uh, as a kind of a charitable enterprise, but an absolutely essential part of the Australian economy and uh, in, in working with government to make this attractive for companies, we uh, hope to make sure that this is sustainable and vibrant. We have an enabling platform to accelerate translation of discovery in Australia, but also global discovery. And this is where we actually embed in our university-based hospitals. We have nine NHMRC supported advanced health research translational centres, which each involve a hub that is a university base with many of its fantastic clinical hospitals associated with it. And so that provides a, a network that can be used for, for clinical trials. And when it comes to first in human, we obviously want to make sure that that's a select number of hospitals. Those university um, hospitals also have fabulous preclinical um, facilities as well for training. We believe that data is a central platform for providing an efficient framework for clinical trials, whether it be device or pharmaceutically based trials. And so understanding how data can best service on this front is something that we're working with government, both at the state level as federal level, uh, to provide the best um, possible answers for researchers, policymakers, and also industry partners. We do think we have one of the world's best health systems. We've got significant funding with rigor, excellence, and impact. 
And now we're investing both human resources as well as funding into data platforms, into governance in terms of how we nationally prioritise key problems, and also in terms of implementation pathways to make sure when we have innovation and evidence that we can actually accelerate to getting it to our patients. It's not necessarily all about funding, it's about the alignment and the culture. And the Alliance has actually been really working closely with the, the fabulous environment here in Australia to make sure that we can make make every dollar that is invested in Australia really count to make a difference to our patients. So on that front, I'm really uh, pleased to introduce um, Professor Jason Kovacic, who actually arrived back in Australia about a week before we closed our borders. And that was actually a planned um, arrival. Jason has a outstanding track record from fundamental uh, science all the way through to interventional uh, cardiology, where he worked um, for about 15 or 16 years in the US, including in New York's Mount Sinai Hospital. Um, Jason has an outstanding track record in first in human device trials, and we're working together to set up an Australian network, which he's gonna tell you about now. So over to you, Jason. Thanks, Gemma. It's um, a great forum and a uh, privilege to be speaking in this company and uh, thanks for the opportunity. So I did wish to um, just give you a little bit of a background about uh, who I am and um, why, why Australia and why now. I have spent the last 13 years in the States, um, starting off with two years in Bethesda, Maryland, actually, at the NIH campus, which is directly across the road from the um, the medical centre where Donald Trump is currently in there with COVID. Um, so after two years at the NIH, then to New York City, to Mount Sinai for the last 11 years. And then I left um, New York very early March and arrived literally, as Gemma said, just before the borders closed. Um, I still remain an active faculty member at, at Mount Sinai. I'm actually jointly appointed as Professor of Medicine and Cardiology at Mount Sinai and at the University of New South Wales and returned to Australia in March to take up the directorship of the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. Um, just to sort of fill in the gaps on my clinical background. So I'm actually uh, trained in cardiology in Australia and also then board certified in cardiology in the States and spent the last 11 years in the cath labs at Mount Sinai. Sinai has one of the busiest cath labs uh, in the world. They have about uh, 11 cath labs, uh, an average of about 6,000 PCIs a year. Um, hundreds of TAVAs a year. I was involved in the, right from the outset of the TAVA program, the transcatheter aortic valve implant program that started in 2011 when I was one of the implanters for the first Medtronic core valve that was uh, part of the first clinical trial in high risk patients of that device. And you can see there some of the cath lab team that's Samin Sharma and Annapurna Kinney, the uh, directors of the cath lab at Mount Sinai, and myself in the background, the tall guy. Uh, so it was a delight to be recruited back to Sydney to take on the directorship of the Victor Chang and to bring some of this experience with the States um, back with me. I can say one thing that I was pondering for the last five or so years in New York City is that if I came back to Australia, uh, what would be one of the things that I would try to achieve and the, and the key contributions I could make? And it was evident to me back then in the States over the last five years that one of the things that Australia was held in very high regard for was its ability to conduct high level quality uh, first in human clinical trials and device based trials and some of the seminal studies had been done in Australia up to that point. But one thing I appreciated was that it's always possible to do a better job. And one of the things that we've set our sights on over the last few months since I've been back in Australia is actually bringing together uh, a formalized network to conduct first in human device-based trials uh, and device-based trials across the spectrum in Australia. And I'll come to speak to you about that in just a moment. Um, so one of the great things about New York City, of course, is it, and Australia is if you're given uh, an opportunity, you can run with it. And I was fortunate to find that uh, I was awarded another NIH grant about a week after I signed the contract to come back to Australia. So I still continue to have a lab in New York City um, that have done a remarkable job and, and now setting up a lab here in Sydney. So I literally span um, the states in New York and Sydney uh, with one research laboratory with two nodes, one in New York and one in Sydney. The question then comes as to really um, why Australia and what is this sophisticated environment that we really have here? 
I think it's really important to highlight a few of the great strengths that Australia has in terms of its, in terms of its very sophisticated medical research environment and healthcare system. Um, we do boast clinical uh, and research excellence and expertise. And as I mentioned, being board certified in both Australia and the States, I can personally speak to the clinical excellence of Australia and the extremely high level of clinical training and clinical abilities that our Australian physicians have. Um, the healthcare system is exceptional in Australia and I think is an ideal balance of uh, healthcare access for all uh, and high-end healthcare and high-end research um, that's competitive at the highest levels on an international stage. We do boast also high quality facilities, including particularly for early device phase uh, and preclinical studies. We have a diverse uh, participant recruitment pool, which includes uh, a very base, is based upon a very diverse, ethnically diverse uh, mix of our Australian population, including large numbers of people from the Southeast Asia region, but also from all over the world. And you can tell Kovacic, my own name, uh, is a European ancestry name. And uh, we really do boast a diverse mix of people, which is ideal for rolling out uh, device-based trials and clinical studies. There is certainly, as we've already heard, uh, significant incentivization in terms of tax breaks for conducting research in Australia and very favorable seasons in Australia. And in fact, none of our capital cities routinely or, or ever receive snow. Uh, making it very easy to get around, even in the middle of winter. Um, mild climate, I think, is very favourable to moving people around, conducting research, bringing people in for site visits and so on, compared to the, some of the harshness that we see across America, uh, and particularly in the northern parts of America, as I was. There's minimal language barriers. English is widely spoken everywhere. Uh, and the cultural barriers, I think, are extremely manageable in Australia. Uh, that, that really break down any barriers to that would otherwise inhibit participation in conduct of clinical trials. And as part of the Asia Pacific region, uh, we're really central uh, in, that, in that area and serve a leadership role and can bring in uh, sites and other, area, other participants from all over the Asia Pacific that we uh, reside in. Let me just go back one. Here. So, um, as I've mentioned, we're working therefore to build uh, this first in human clinical trials network, device based network. And that's building on, I think, some of the strengths of Australia, some of the strengths that Gemma and I bring to the table, and some of the work that I've been involved in in Mount Sinai, but particularly in the knowledge that Australia has done an exceptionally good job with device based trials in the past, but there's always an opportunity to do better. <clears throat> so, what we're working to do now is to bring together many of the key stakeholders in Australia um, to really harmonise and streamline the conducting of device-based clinical trials across our country. These are some of the key uh, aspects here, why Australia and why device-based trials. Uh, I think there's a lot of local innovation and I'll come to some of that in just a moment in terms of some of the strengths of the research that have been and are being conducted. There's great coordination and collaboration across Australia. We do have world leading clinical systems, as I've said. There are some uh, expert world class interventionalists and other clinicians in our country that truly stand uh, high on an international stage and outstanding preclinical facilities, as you can see there. That particular hybrid OR being based uh, only a couple of miles from where I'm sitting in the Charles Perkins Centre on the Prince Alfred Hospital campus. As has already been said, but I think very worth underscoring, Australia is extremely well positioned in terms of COVID. Um, where we are in New South Wales, been, there's been essentially no new transmission of cases in the last 10 or so days. The couple of cases that we have were actually from travellers that came back and are currently under quarantine. Uh, we really are looking at a situation of it almost being COVID free in terms of internal transmission within Australia within a couple of months from now things are rapidly opening up. And I think this is a really important feature that this both means trials can be done safely, but it also means that our sites are open for business and we're able to move ahead. It is important, I think, to touch on some of the clinical excellence and research expertise that, is, uh, that really is a hallmark of Australia. Here you can see Martin Ng. Martin's a uh, colleague of ours, um, just a couple of miles away at uh, Prince Alfred Hospital. 
He's an internationally regarded uh, clinician and innovator, has been involved in a range of clinical trials. And you can see there below some of the results, this is the man that received the first ball in cage um, uh, valve prosthesis done in the very early 70s. Um, that valve prosthesis survived for decades, well beyond its anticipated lifespan. Martin Nung has been involved in many um, high level international studies and he's just one of many investigators, but worth just highlighting as a, a case example. Uh, he recently completed the Pascal uh, studies that were intrepid studies in uh, looking at the Pascal and a device, which is a next generation mitral valve repair system. And worth noting that the overall 30 day mortality of the study was around 14%, uh, but of the Australian centres, the 30 day mortality was zero. Really, I think testifying to our ability to very safely and expertly conduct these important and pivotal first in human studies. Other great uh, work being done in Australia here, you can see Ralph Bindi, who's across at North Shore with Gemma Figtree. Um, this is just another of the examples, a uh, New England Journal publication that very recently showed that instantaneous um, free wave ratio uh, is equivalent to FFR in guiding PCI, uh, a hallmark landmark study, again, with several Australian investigators and Ralph Bindi that you can see there was one of the key players. So what we're doing now with ACVA is really building this uh, national coordination for device-based clinical trials. And you can see here just some of the framework and the things that are uh, going into building this um, Queensland is one of the uh, main states of Australia, larger states, uh, which is a fantastic hub for cardiothoracic surgery. And that will be coming online as part of our national coordinated device-based trials network as really a centre for cardiothoracic involvement, preclinical engineering, uh, biotechnology-based engagement across the country and, and uh, really being one of the hubs of our network. New South Wales, where I am and Gemma is, uh, really has a stronghold in structural heart and coronary interventions, and that will be one of the, the key hubs for this national device-based trials network. And Victoria, uh, to the south, is well-renowned for coronary and electrophysiology, and we'll be capitalising on their expertise as we build this national network for device-based trials. Um, so in terms of harmonising some of the things we're doing across this uh, Australian Cardiovascular Device Clinical Trials Collaborative. This will be the launching pad as we see it for trials of cardiac devices. We'll be leveraging many aspects and facets to bring, really to bring this network together and to get the most out of this um, for our participating trialists. And this will include brokerage and connection of clinical trial specialists and subspecialists through ACVA and our clinical trials network streamlining of startup and trial execution, site management and other such uh, logistic coordination. The regulatory expertise will be brought to the fore, including expertise with the FDA. And some of my colleagues um, in the States will actually be partnering with us to facilitate that. Uh, ethics committee advice and liaison and harmonization, Coordinate, coordination of clinical trial expert practitioners from ACVA and our clinical trial networks, uh, national membership working across multiple sites, multi-pronged recruitment approaches and pre-screening pre services for sponsors, concierge services for patients, uh, tailored communication and other aspects. So I think you can see we really are building something that will truly position Australia as being at the very forefront of first in human device-based trials uh, and indeed clinical trials across the full spectrum. That leads me just to conclude with uh, calling out some of our partners. Uh, you can see here, these are some of the many industry partners that have already uh, engaged and bought into this process of building uh, this first in human device-based trials network. Uh, it really is uh, growing rapidly. Uh, it's been fantastic to see, and we're looking forward to your partnering with us as we uh, bring this to the fore to facilitate clinical trials in Australia at an international level. Duncan, thank you. Thanks so much, Jason and Gemma. And it's clear that ACVA is a really great mix of industry clinicians and academics who are there to help you run trials in Australia. So with that, I'd find, like to introduce Mr. Falco Thiele, uh, Director of Clinical and Regulatory Affairs for Biotronic Australia. 
Falco is going to talk to us about Biotronics experiences as a multinational medical device company running trials in Australia. Over to you, Falco. Uh, thanks, Duncan. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Austrade and MTP Connect, for inviting me to speak here today and uh, share with you my or our experience as a multinational company in running clinical trials in Australia. Um, so I'm not sure how many startup companies are on this call, but this is my relationship building slide. We were once like you, uh, albeit it was uh, almost 60 years ago when um, Max Schaldach here in the lower, um, what is that, right-hand corner of the picture, left-hand corner of the picture, uh, shown developed the first implantable pacemaker in Germany. Um, there was uh, the, the very first implantable pacemaker was only developed five years earlier. Um, and obviously based on that work, um, Biotronic was founded and Max Schaldach uh, built uh, into what is today a, a multinational company. We're active in more than 100 countries. We do R&D and we have manufacturing facilities all over the globe. Um, main focus points are of course Germany, um, Switzerland, but we also have R&D in the United States in manufacturing and um, uh, recently moving into Singapore as well. Obviously when you're present around the world, that means that your, your clinical trials program also spans the entire globe and in fact all our businesses. So what are these businesses? Um, we are solidly, firmly in the cardiovascular space. So we have three business units. One is the cardiac rhythm management. So implantable pacemakers, implantable defibrillators, the, the leads that go with it, um, implantable loop recorders, programming devices, and so on. Uh, the second business unit is the vascular intervention. So uh, stents, balloons, guide wires, both for coronary and the peripheral applications. And the third business is electrophysiology, so ablation catheters, diagnostic catheters, um, uh, recently a, a very innovative 3D mapping system. We do clinical trials across all these areas, and those range from regulatory studies to approve the safety of our devices, all the way to landmark studies that expand indications um, and and um, we do basically to advance science and not purely for the benefit of our products. So a company that clearly has the capacity to play, uh, conduct clinical trials all, all over the world, what influences our decision to run trials in Australia? And please note that I'm using the present here because that decision is actually made anew every time we start a new project. It's not a set and forget decision. We keep asking ourselves the question, is Australia still the place or do we need to go somewhere else? Fortunately for me here in Australia, um, we uh, arrive at that decision that Australia is the place to be for us. And, and here are some reasons that are important to us. Uh, Dan already quite nicely explained the clinical trial notification scheme, which basically means you can do a, a clinical trial in Australia with a product prior to CE mark, prior to FDA approval. Um, so we do it after we have done all our validation tests. So the product is ready and this is how we will go to market. But before we launch, we'll conduct a, a first in human study in Australia. Um, clinical trials here are conducted according to good clinical practice, um, obviously for medical devices, ISO 14155. Um, that means the results are transferable to the CE area, uh, to the US and so on. Um, study startup times, uh, Dan already spoke about this, they are competitive. Obviously as somebody working in the field, I, I always like to see it faster. But the good thing is we are addressing this. So, and, and Gemma alluded to this, a government is actually on board. The health minister himself has more than once um, emphasized clinical research as one of his priorities. So we have a lot of support in improving the systems in Australia to uh, become even faster in our startup times. And um, something that sounds a bit boring is actually quite important. The documentation of the guidelines. Very often when I work with our partners in, in Germany or in the US, um, I get asked all these questions. What about adverse event reporting? How do the clinical trial research agreements work? So all this is very nicely documented in Australia 
um, which makes it very easy to answer those questions, which in turn gives my colleagues, um, uh, you know, at, on the other continents, a lot of confidence that um, uh, they have certainty in what is required of us running the trial here. The second column here, almost as important or, or just as important, yeah, we have dedicated trained research staff. This is not the case everywhere in the world, but here we have research coordinators that actually are trained in the, in the craft of running clinical trials. Uh, they are very dedicated. They want to make this happen. The investigators, you already met Gemma and Jason, um, very keen investigators, um, some of them international um, key opinion leaders. But very important to us is they are keen. They love to exchange ideas. Uh, obviously for a first in human study, it's very important for us to bring them together with the engineers. Uh, and, and whenever we ask them, hey, is it possible that our engineers come and visit you while you're conducting the study? The door is always open and they take the time to describe not only what worked, what didn't work, but also give very detailed feedback on how uh, the product could be improved. There's a strong commitment to data quality. I think um, uh, Jason explained that uh, in, in great detail. We have a diverse patient population, but everybody speaks English. So there is no effort in translating patient information, consent forms, and so on and so forth. Everything is done in English. Please be aware, in order to conduct a clinical study in Australia, the sponsor must be an Australian entity, but that could also be a third party. So uh, for instance, a, a CRO, a clinical research organization. So how, how does Biotronic do it? How do we do it? Um, and of course there are other options. So let me talk about how we do it. So we were in a, in a good position in that we already had an established company in Australia when we decided to bring clinical trials here or to run clinical trials in Australia as well. Um, so we built our in-house clinical trials team and didn't rely on CROs. Um, Initially, the strategy was that we were just tagging on to those international multi-center trials that Biotronic was conducting elsewhere in the world. Um, um, and that was done basically to yeah, do a bit of brand building and, and advertise the, the keenness of the investigators to not just talk about the data quality, quality, but actually show it and demonstrate that we are bringing good results. It was also an exercise for the local team to show that we are able to deliver the goods yeah, and, and, and have very few queries, uh, get the startup right, uh, get, the, get the patient enrollment going. And importantly, basically what I'm doing now here, um, to advertise Australia as a destination for trials. Obviously, once you're part of the studies, you can talk about Australia, we can talk about how things are done here. Before too long, um, the, the CTN scheme, the available of this very short regulatory pathway helped to convince our headquarters that Australia is in fact a great destination for first and human uh, device trials. And um, so we were given the opportunity probably five years ago to run the first of, of these studies exclusively in Australia. And obviously those of you in a, in a commercial position know there is a lot of pressure between when the product is ready and the company is itching to bring it to market and there is a clinical study that needs to be run. There's a lot of pressure on getting it right, getting the patients in quickly, get the data, close it out so that the, the results can be evaluated, a decision can be made, go, no go. Yeah, so there was a lot of pressure. Fortunately for us, we pulled through. And um, we are now, um, I think this year we've conducted three of those projects um, uh, in, in one year. So great success story, sorry. Are there other options? Of course there are. So especially if you don't have a, a local subsidiary in Australia, you can use a clinical research organization. Um, there are many of those in Australia and they range from very small, a dedicated boutique niche players to the big multinationals that you're probably all familiar with. Um, some of them are full service, so they can, they can write the protocol for you, they can set up the whole study, or you may have those capabilities in-house and uh, just appoint somebody to execute the study for you in Australia and rely on their access to investigator networks to, um, to get your, your study group, your group of PIs together quickly. There's also another option, um, and I think uh, Jason um, alluded to that, there are a number of academic research organizations that are building or are having investigator networks as well. Um, 
might be an option as well for you. Um, they run mainly investigator initiated studies, but maybe this is also an option uh, if you're more focused on um, uh, researching certain diseases and so on. Yeah, but uh, the CRO is obviously more um, commercial. And um, feel free, uh, Peter offered it, uh, feel free to reach out to Austrade, uh, feel free to reach out to MTP Connect uh, to get in contact with these um, CROs. And with that, I'll give back to Duncan, I believe. Thanks so much for that, Falco. I really appreciate that that, um, that, that kind shout out to, to both uh, Austrade and MTP Connect. And I would reiterate that, yes, if, if you are looking to run a trial in Australia, um, please feel free to get in contact with either of us and we'll be more than help, happy to put you in contact with CRO or ACVA or whoever is relevant. And I would also point out that while this uh, seminar has been very heavily focused on um, devices in the CV space, all of the arguments hold true for any other kind of medical device that you might be looking at running. Um, so we have some time for Q&A now. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so I'm going to ask Dan a question. Dan, we heard about um, how well the federal and state governments in Australia dealt with COVID-19. We didn't escape the impact though. MTP Connect has put out uh, a couple of reports talking about this impact. Can you give us a bit more information about that, please? I, I can, Duncan, so thanks for that. <clears throat> I think what, like, like most parts of the economy, the med tech, biotech and pharma sector in Australia was hit pretty hard by COVID early on in, in the pandemic, where particularly for the med tech sector, elective surgeries were canceled. And as a result, our med tech sector saw a substantial drop in, the, in their revenues. Much of that has recovered, fortunately, because we've, we've seen that Australia has responded well to COVID-19. Um, with the exception of, of Victoria, we haven't seen a second wave in most of our states. And so the, so the med tech sector has responded quite well. Elective surgeries have, have um, reinitiated and, and revenues are flowing again. But I would say that, that one of the things we haven't talked about in terms of of why coming to Australia as a med tech company wanting to do clinical trials is that we do have a very strong med tech sector already in Australia. And that med tech sector played a really critical role in Australia's response to COVID-19. Like most countries early on in March when the pandemic was, was obviously going to be a major challenge, countries around the world recognized that there, there was gonna be a challenge in terms of having sufficient access to medical technologies, ventilators, um, PPE, ICU equipment, a range of other gowns, gloves, masks, everything that you could imagine. And our med tech sector actually played a central role in preparing Australia for the pandemic, working closely um, with the federal and state governments, our med tech sector through the Medical Technologies Association of Australia came together to develop what, what has been called the Australian model of collaboration, where these companies helped work to ensure that we had access to supply chains um, to ensure that we had ventilators in Australia, PPE needed should we have been hit hard by the pandemic. Now, we, we weren't hit that hard, fortunately, um, but, but the sector worked very hard to put that in place. And so I, I would shout out to the, the med tech sector itself for, for the work they've done, but also flag that it's a nice environment to be doing your clinical trials because there are manufacturing capabilities here. We did see a lot of, of Australia's manufacturers put their hand up to pivot towards manufacturing medical technologies during our initial response. And, and groups like Gray Innovation, who, who use the Smith ventilator um, um, IP to develop ventilators in Australia, others like Gecko, we saw ResMed step up. Um, we, we also saw my favorite distillery, um, Archie Rose, convert from making gin to making ethanol for hand sanitizers. And while that might have been a bit of a uh, a sad day for, for, for those of us who like to drink gin, I think it flags the fact that, that our sector itself is ready to do more than just clinical trials, but there are capabilities here for manufacturing, there are capabilities here for regulatory advice. At, um, and Falco talked about getting, getting access to CROs. We have the full, full breadth, if you like, of the sector here to support med technology being developed um, in Australia. And Duncan, if I may chime in, um, even with respect to clinical trials, obviously the knee-jerk reaction is if something like COVID hits, you want to preserve your resources and shut down all the clinical trials. In Australia, we actually took a different approach and um, very early on um, sort of 
made sure that we are not forgetting clinical trials because they are also the solution to, to the problem, obviously. Um, and um, clinical trials actually did happen throughout COVID. Um, some centers changed, uh, obviously, how they did it a little bit. Yeah, So monitors could not come in person, but were given remote access. But we didn't shut down shop completely during those times. I think Thanks the so other much. thing that, that, that happened, Duncan, is that, that companies like um, Biotronic, but also groups like Cochlear, um, didn't abandon their research activities either. So their, their preclinical research activities. And, and in a report that we released today on, on sort of the second phase of COVID and the impact on the sector, which is available on our website or will be later today, um, we saw groups like Cochlear continue to invest in research, um, even though perhaps they were seeing that that sales were down and that clinical trials were perhaps slower than, than they, they would have hoped. And so I think the sector is really strong, both from a, a preclinical research perspective, but also from that clinical research perspective. Thanks, Dan. And of course, the good news is I think that uh, Archie Rose is still making gin as well. So that's they are. Uh, they are. good news for everyone. Gemma, a, a question for you um, and for the ACVA. If a company does want to do a CV trial in Australia, how does the interaction model work? How do they come to you and how do they get things kicked off? Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, we're very approachable. Um, we're currently recruiting our um, inaugural uh, front front uh, door, so to speak, um, and we're really hoping to make it as friendly as possible. The bits that are already in place are, are obviously the um, the network of clinicians and the preclinical opportunities. Um, what we're trying to do is just package that to make it as easy as possible, and also to streamline um, the ethics and governance, as well as the connection with the right CRO for for you guys. Jason, any further comments on on that? No, I, I echo that, Gemma. I think. Um... You know, if, if companies are interested in reaching out, then ACBA is very approachable. And I can say that there's actually already intense interest, uh, certainly in the States, from the, my colleagues in Mount Sinai and through other large um, international organisations to start bringing some of their research down to Australia. And uh, we'll be onboarding those uh, entities very soon. So I think the answer is feel free to email Jason or I in the meantime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fantastic. Or if you need to get hold of Jason or Gemma, feel, do feel free to uh, contact Austrade or MTP Connect. Mm. Dan, this one might be for you. One of our um, audience, mem audience members has asked, what separates Australia from Singapore in terms of clinical trial capability, capacity and the R&D tax incentive? Yeah, so I can't comment specifically on Singapore's tax incentives. But what I can say is that our R&D tax incentive, particularly for small companies, getting 43.5% back cash into the entity is, is, what is really unique um, and is making a huge difference. Our venture capital um, community, our spin-out companies, they all find this really central to, um, to, to being able to actually progress their activities. In terms, of, in terms of ethnic diversity, we probably have broader ethnic diversity than Singapore has. Um, we have clinical trial capabilities, as I said earlier, that are world's, world's best. So we, we clearly have a strong sector. That's not saying that, that Singapore doesn't have strong, a strong sector, but indeed ours is classed in the world's top. So I think if you look at that, and, and as I mentioned, you also need to look at, at how easy it is to recruit patients. As I mentioned, that, that upwards of 500,000 patients per year are stepping forward to participate in clinical trials in Australia. That's really a, a key factor for a country that only has 25 million people. It's the view of patients, consumers, that, that clinical trials are critically important in their normal everyday healthcare. So clinical trials need to become thought of as, as part of standard of care almost, as opposed to simply a last resort. And so I think we have that view in the community already that patients wanna participate where they can, they're actively participating, the government's supporting the sector strongly through the MRFF, through the R&D tax incentive, we've got strong IP uh, legislation in Australia, we've got great KOLs and infrastructure, all of that bodes very well for people coming to do clinical trials. And I think Falco's, Falco's story of, of their using Australia for their, their first in human studies is, is really an indication of the value that you can gain for doing trials in Australia. 
Yeah, Duncan, Thank if you. I'm allowed to just echo some of that. I mean, we're currently working on some very innovative ways to, to improve the efficiency of, uh, of recruitment of patients. And, and that involves patients, or, sorry, individuals that are healthy in the community at the moment, actually volunteering to have their um, linked data uh, available for screening for, for trials. And that's predominantly um, you know, going to be used in the near future, hopefully for um, vaccine trials. But also we, we hope that some of this also will benefit um, you know, things right back to, to finding the best patients for you for early through to later phase device trials. Thanks, Gemma. We have had a question in the chat about whether there's a list or source of qualified CROs by device type. Um, yes, I will get in contact with you and, and help you find the, the correct CRO. So more than happy to help there. Look, I just wanna thank all of our panelists for their contribution today. Um, it's been a fantastic session, I think. Um, many thanks to Austrade for their support and please get in contact with uh, myself or uh, MTP Connect or Austrade if you'd like to know more about running trials in, in Australia and we will help you make the relevant links. We'd appreciate it if you could send us your feedback on the value of this webinar via the survey that will be emailed to you and we promise it won't take more than five minutes of your time. Finally, just also like to point out that uh, Austrade and MTP Connect are also joining forces to present the Australian MedTech Pavilion at the virtual MedTech conference at the moment. So if you are registered for the conference, please do feel free to have a look uh, at uh, some of the fantastic Australian companies and service providers um, who are presenting. You can also contact ACVA via that way. So thank you all again. Uh, have a great evening or morning, wherever you are. Thanks all. Bye.